Hello, I'm Faisal Pervez, a South Asia analyst at Stratfor, and this podcast is brought to you by Stratfor Worldview, the world's leading geopolitical intelligence platform. Individual, team, and enterprise memberships are available at worldview.stratfor.com slash subscribe. I brought my kids up and I gave them a few things, a Bible, a copy of the Constitution, an old brass a nautical compass. The fourth thing was the tomahawk. I said, hey, that Bible and that Constitution are there to guide you along with that compass. And the tomahawk gives you the means to defend them. Welcome to the Stratfall podcast from worldview.stratfall.com. I'm your host, Ben Sheen. Best-selling author Jack Carr is here to talk about his new book, True Believer. In it, he explores the impact of terrorism on the global system, and financial markets in particular. In the follow-up to Carr's first book, The Terminal List, we're reunited with former Navy SEAL James Reese, who finds himself at the heart of a geopolitical conspiracy and has to use every ounce of his skill, cunning, and heroism to stay one step ahead of the game. True Believer has already been called one of the best thrillers of 2019, and Stratfor's chief security officer, Fred Burton, had a chance to speak with Jack Carr about his career as a Navy SEAL sniper, his life as an outdoorsman, and now best-selling author. Let's join Jack Carr and Fred Burton in the Stratfor studio. I am Fred Burton here today with Jack Carr, who has his new book, True Believer, coming out July 30th. Jack, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, we had such a wonderful time last podcast talking yep. about uh, the terminal list. So tell me a little bit about True Believer, even though I have read it. Ah, all right. Well, True Believer picks up where the terminal list left off. And whereas the terminal list was really a story of revenge without constraint. And there were a couple of levels to it, though. You could read it just like that, just as a an action adventure, political thriller, or you could look at it uh, a little deeper as somebody that uh, was taking the tactics and techniques of the enemy and essentially becoming the terrorist or insurgent he'd been fighting for the last 16 plus years at war uh, on, on home soil. Or you could go even a little deeper and look at it as, hey, this is a veteran of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, bringing those wars home to the people that have been sending young men and women to die overseas from their comfortable offices in Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C. So there are a couple different levels to it, but really it was a novel of revenge without constraint. Uh, True Believer is a story of redemption. So it's uh, it, the challenge is to have a story arc, not just within each and every novel, but also throughout a series. So uh, that was the uh, that was the impetus behind True Believer. Well, and it's hard not to like the former Navy SEAL James Reese. Tell me a little bit about that character. How did you de- develop that character? He has, he has a background similar to mine in that he was a prior enlisted Navy SEAL sniper who became an officer along the way. And when we meet him in the terminal list, he's at that point in his career where he won't be leading men tactically on the battlefield anymore. And he's made the decision to get out and take care of his family. And that's when disaster strikes. But as I created the character, uh, he's definitely not me, by the way. He's, uh, he's <laughs> definitely much more skilled, uh, stronger, wittier, better looking than I could ever hope to be. So uh, it's just a little bit of my background woven in there and my personal experience and taking those experiences from the battlefield and taking those emotions and applying them to a fictional narrative. So as people read what the protagonist is feeling in these novels, the emotions and feelings are real things that I felt at some point along the way. But I really wanted is was a likable character that uh, could flip the switch and instantly get the job done and go back to his skills and his experience to uh, really bring death and destruction to those that that wronged him. So um, so it was important to have a, a likable character, someone you'd want to have a beer with, someone you want to go have coffee with, but then also somebody that you knew could flip that switch. And I love the line, somewhere a true believer is training to kill you. What's the background on that? 
Right. So I couldn't find exactly where that came from, but uh, my research showed that it was a special forces instructor somewhere on Fort Bragg, somewhere over the last 20 years. And uh, he has this quote talking about uh, true believers out there and really who the enemy is. And it's uh, it's a quote that kind of juxtaposes what we do every day and most people getting up and going to work and coming home. And then it talks about the true believer out there, uh, the person that doesn't go home at the end of the day. The, the only thing clean on him is his weapon. So it's a it's a, a quote really about the enemy. And I used to read that to my guys in my platoon and my troop just to give them a sense of who we were up against and what, uh, and you know, what they were, what they were risking for what they believed. It's a very powerful statement. Tell me a little bit about your writing habits. I, I know we were chatting a little bit before we started about you're sitting there with your black rifle coffee. Uh, talk to <laughs> me a right. little bit about your day. So I have my uh, my silencer smooth, which is a light roast black rifle coffee in front of me, and I'm on I've got cup four right now because um, I had to get up early to do a little post uh, because without Brad I would definitely not be where I am today. And uh, I wanted to write since I was a little kid, and really Brad opened the door to New York publishing for me, and I could not be more appreciative of what uh, of what he's done for me. So uh, I got up early to make that post and make sure that the uh, that everything was was set up for our podcast and our conversation today, and as soon as this is over, then I dive in to writing. And book three is actually due the rough draft anyway. Oh my. And wow. Yeah, so, so I'm coming up against it now, but it's uh, it's getting really close. I was writing all day last night. It's old. It's about a little after midnight and I'll be back at it today, probably after till after midnight again, just to get it as good as I can possibly get it before I send it to Emily Bessler at uh, Emily Bessler Books, Simon & Schuster in New York. And we'll probably go back and forth. Well, we will go back and forth on it. It's until October when the galley copies come out or should come out. But uh, but I want to get it as good as I can possibly get it before I send it to her and another set of eyes sees it. So I will lock it down in a friend's uh, house who's uh, away right now. And it, so it's nice and quiet because we have three kiddos here uh, and a dog that I will go to a nice quiet house and set up and turn everything off, turn off the phone, turn off my email and dive into writing on a program I just found called Scrivener. Uh, and I've, so far I've written in Word, but Scrivener allows you to see things and arrange them so you can s visually see your chapters and drag and drop them to rearrange them instead of having to copy and paste in Word. And you can see it visually in front of you like you would on a corkboard. But really, it starts with an idea. And with the terminal list, the title came right away. Same thing with True Believer. Title came uh, for this third one. The title is still classified, but uh, it took a little more, little more doing to, to figure out that title. But it, it starts with uh, that idea, that one page synopsis, kind of like an executive summary, and then an outline. And as I go and other ideas bubble to the surface as I'm writing, then I fill in that outline. As I go along, I fill in missing pieces and until I get to about the 75% mark. And then I discard the outline because it becomes uh, not as efficient to work from that anymore. And I just work on the document itself. And uh, I love every single second of it and every single part of the process. Well, I really appreciate you sharing that. We have a lot of uh, fans that are writing books or want to get published and, and so forth. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we've put together this podcast uh, as well as to reach uh, readers that like the this genre, uh, nonfiction and thrillers and so forth. And uh, so how you go about doing that, uh, there's always great lessons learned. We had that same conversation with uh, Brad Thor not too long ago. And I know your publisher has amazing marketing. When I received my pre-publication review, it came in that beautiful box with uh, your true believer red tape around it and even a sticker and a card. It's like getting a Christmas present. I know when it arrived, I couldn't hardly wait to open it. Thank you. Yeah, that was the idea behind it. And I think that's going to be one of the signatures of uh, books as uh, I move into the future here will be that packaging and what that card says and that card giving uh, early readers a little glimpse into the background of what inspired the novel. Like in this one, I think I mentioned the uh, Iraqi officer that uh, I worked with in Iraq in 2006 that really inspired the plot to True Believer. So I know the official jackcar.com website is just unbelievable and you have all your gear listed and so forth and from knives to hatchets and talk to me a little bit about the Sig Sauer 226 and the P365. I know we carried the 226 when I was an agent with the State Department. I guess the SEALs must have copied us. 
<laughs> must be, must be. So, uh, well, the rest of the military had the uh, Breda 92F at some point along the line, well before I came into the military, the SEAL teams went to the SIG P226. And uh, I'm not sure about the background of why they, they switched over, but they were allowed to switch over. So when I came in, that was uh, the handgun of choice. And that is the handgun that was on my hip through all of my deployments. So I have a soft spot in my heart for the, uh, the SIG P226. And I love the people at SIG. People that are running that company right now are just amazing people. Everyone they have associated, uh, it's just a, a great product. So a SIG is never far from my reach, um, including right now. Uh, and then the 226, <laughs> which came out this last year, um, I mean, what an amazing product. And I want to put it through an actual course. So like a two or three day course and do one with a subcompact pistol, um, which is what the the uh, 365 is uh, to really put it through the paces. But uh, I love the uh, extra magazine capacity in there and it's comfortable to carry every day. And I, I yeah, can't say enough good things about the 226 and the 365. And I did just get the uh, the X carry as well. So the, the P320 X carry. And I uh, just got my holster from Black Point Tactical for that. So I'll start putting that through the paces as well. And what's with the two closed hatchets? When I look at the logo on your site, how did you design that? That's really uh, also kind of a unique signature for you, isn't it? It is. And so those are Winkler uh, R&D SIOC hatchets. And there's something that's real special to me and to a lot of people in special operations. But when I retired from the military, I gave uh, my kids uh, gifts. And uh, at my retirement party, I brought my kids up and I gave them a, a few things. And one was a, a Bible. The other was a leather bound copy of the Constitution. The other was an old compass, an old brass uh, nautical compass. That's and neat. Then the, the fourth thing was the tomahawk. So I said, hey, that uh, that Bible and that Constitution uh, are there to guide you along with that compass so you don't lose your way. And the tomahawk gives you the means to defend them. So as I was designed, thinking of a logo, I put their two hatchets on the ground and I crossed them and took a picture of it and said, okay, this is it. And of course, Daniel Winkler has been a dear friend of mine for years who designs the hatchets uh, in um, North Carolina. He did the all the weapons for uh, Last of the Mohicans. So he's just a, an amazing guy, a huge supporter of the military and special operations in general. So uh, I have a, a personal connection to, uh, to him, to his line of knives and hatchets. And of course, it's uh, used with uh, devastating uh, <laughs> efficiency in the terminal list and uh, as well as true believer yeah i think we need uh the uh, two crossed hatchets baseball caps <laughs> that would be a nice uh, addition to your website and store there i think Maybe. So we've uh, we actually talked about a couple of those things, but I want to take it nice and easy and um, you know, be very thoughtful about uh, how I move forward into that into that realm. But the uh, the website's really for people that want to take a deeper dive into well, both the writing process, uh, publishing world, and then get a little bit uh, deeper on the gear. So a lot of times in the in novels, you don't want to spend too much time talking about the intricacies of each and every one of these weapons, but you can on a website. So uh, that's going to be a, a living website that changes quite frequently and is added to quite frequently so people can stay up to date on all the guns and gear. And I'll be doing reviews of things that I used in the military and things that I continue to use today as I go forth into the, into the wilderness with my family now. We'll get back to Jack Carr and Fred Burton in just one moment. Although the events in Carr's book are fictional, his real life experience has placed him in plenty of situations where real time intelligence and geopolitical awareness were critical to his success. Stratfor Enterprise and Stratfor ThreatLens are designed to help corporate security leaders maintain their focus when it comes to identifying, anticipating, and mitigating geopolitical risk. Emerging threats can pose hazards to people, assets, and interests all around the world, and you need a reliable, customizable tool to stay abreast of developments, large and small. Stratfor's clients rely on a suite of products and platforms to pinpoint evolving geopolitical events tailored to their organizational requirements so they can forecast and implement protective measures with the utmost confidence. If you're not already a Stratfor member, you can learn more at stratfor.com slash enterprise. Now let's get back to Jack Carr and Fred Burton. I'm talking to Jack Carr about his new thriller, True Believer, that comes out on July 30th. Uh, and I also noted that 
there was a little bit delay with uh, the Pentagon clearing your book this time. I, I know from firsthand experience with my last book, it took uh, the agency 11 months to, to clear the book. And wow. I, I know that doesn't make publishers happy. So uh, explain to me the uh, delay. And uh, I also noted in True Believer that there's a few words that are blacked out. There are a few more than there were blacked out in the terminal <laughs> list. So, um, and by the way, I loved Beirut rules. Uh, took me right back to growing up in the '80s and following all the all the stories of uh, things that were going on in the Middle East at the time, and really pushed me towards going into the military, into special operations, so that I could do something about it. So, um, so I absolutely love Beirut rules. So, thank you for uh, for writing that. Oh, why? Thank you. That's very kind of you to say that. I appreciate those fine words. Of course, of course. So yeah, the review process, it was interesting because typically um, people do not submit fiction. But because of the, the timing of The Terminal List, my first novel, it was just going on in the SEAL team, some other nonfiction books that had been published and caused a little bit of a controversy, uh, I wanted to make sure that I was honoring my former security clearances. And the way that the regulation is written, it's really broad uh, by design, most likely, like a lot of uh, <laughs> laws and regulations sure. from the, the government. Uh, as a, to give them the most leeway possible. But uh, so I wanted to make sure that I was doing the right thing. So I submitted the terminal list and it, they advertised a 30 day review. And so I thought, okay, that's, that's pretty good. They got it back in 45 days. Not bad for a huge bureaucracy and no. for, for the government. My goodness. And I thought that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, not bad. And they took out, I think, nine, nine words or so, nine sentences in the terminal list. So not bad. And I thought, well, okay, we should definitely do this again with True Believer. So submitted it. And waited. Thirty days passed. Sixty days passed. Ninety days passed. Uh, so it took them seven months to do their thirty-day review this time on a book of fiction. So I guess that uh, over there at the Pentagon, they're, maybe they're not big readers over there, uh, or the or the, st or the stacks are getting a little higher. But for whatever reason, it took a long time, and they did take out a lot more this time around than they did in the first novel. So this time, I'm going to appeal it though, and you have a year to appeal. And if uh, I win on appeal, then by the time the paperback comes out, I'll be able to take those redactions out. And I think every single redaction except for one, my attorneys have found on government websites in uh, congressional testimony. So out there, not just on a Wikipedia or something like that, but on an actual official government website or official government public document. So um, every single sentence has been uh, submitted back to the Office of Pre-Publication and Security Review for or an appeal, and we shall see how it turns out. That's an amazing story. I, you're the first person that I've talked to uh, in, in quite some time that's actually appealed the process. By the time uh, I got Beirut rules back, I was just exhausted with the, the book and the process, as you well understand. And of course, uh, the publisher just, we needed to get the book out. So uh, we didn't want to try to go down the appeal process because Lord knows how long that would have taken the agency to to deal with. <laughs> exactly. So it, it's really that uncertainty of not knowing when the government's going to give you the okay, because you know, publishers, just like just like movies, have to figure out when uh, when they're going to put a book out, who other authors in the genre that are coming out at the same time, and they have to work all that out uh, well in advance. So having that uncertainty there for them is definitely uncomfortable. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so seven months did, yeah, definitely made us push the publication day from April 1st to July 30th. So uh, now here we go uh, for a, a summer release. Well, that's awesome. Now, uh, where are your destinations for your book tour? It starts in Phoenix at Poison Pen on July 29th. So the night before the uh, the book actually drops officially, they have uh, permission to, to sell them that day before. So uh, I'll be there. And what's even, I mean, it's so humbling for me that I'll be there with Stephen Hunter. So Stephen Hunter, of course, is the author that created the character Bob Lee Swagger. Sure. With the novel Point of Impact that turned into the movie Shooter. And he could not have been more supportive of my first novel. Gave me a great blurb. I've been a huge fan of him and his character, his writing. I think it's it's the best out there, and I, I could not believe when he when he was so kind with the publication of my my first novel with that blurb. Then he sent me his new book, Game of Snipers, which also comes out July 30th. Uh, sent me the galley and asked me for a blurb. Oh so, wow! 
Yeah. Incredible. Such an honor. I, 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 it's just incredible. So I uh, gave him a blurb and now we're going to start our book tours together at the same bookstore the same night. And Mark Graney, who writes the Gray Man series and sure. wrote some of the, uh, the later Tom Clancy novels, um, is just an amazing guy. Also incredibly supportive and really just welcomed me into the kind of the club of scribes with open arms. Uh, he'll be there to interview both of us. So I could not be more excited about the launch on the 29th there at Poison Pen in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, then from there, uh, I head off for essentially two weeks on the road. So I'll be in uh, Denver, I'll be in Colorado Springs, I'll be in Houston, um, Dallas, uh, San Diego, and a few other places uh, scattered across the country. So very excited to, to get on the road and be able to thank everyone uh, for being so supportive uh, because without, without the fans, without people out there that are interested in the character, interested in these novels, passing the word, talking to friends, talking to family, telling them they'd enjoyed it. That's really what made the terminal list such a success. So for me, being able to get out there and thank everyone in person is, uh, is really special. Well, your tempo of putting these books together is uh, something that's very unique. I mean, you've, you've got the terminal list and now True Believer and your third, you're, you're uh, submitting very quickly. That, uh, no wonder you're drinking so much Black Rifle coffee. <laughs> That's how it goes. Uh, but it's my, I, I was always going to write two novels. So I started True Believer before I'd even submitted the terminal list to Simon & Schuster because there were just too many instances of authors out there that uh, didn't make it on their first novel but then wrote a second one, and that's the one that hit. So um, John Grisham is probably the best example of that. He wrote uh, A Time to Kill first. And he couldn't give that novel away. Then he wrote The Firm. Then they make the movie. It takes off. And, of course, that propels him along uh, along his, uh, his path. So if he had stopped at that first novel, if he'd stopped and got discouraged after A Time to Kill, which, by the way, I think is arguably his best novel, um, he, we wouldn't have Pelican Brief. We wouldn't have The Client. We wouldn't have this, this wonderful library of work from John Grisham. So um, same thing with Vince Flynn, self-published uh, uh, Term Limits, which uh, is one of my favorite novels in the genre. And uh, that's the one that got noticed by Simon & Schuster, by Emily Bessler Books, and that's the one that propelled him along. So uh, he just stuck with it and, you know, you know, that's that's the advice when I first talked to Brad Thor. That's the advice that he gave me in our first conversation. He said the only difference between a published author and an unpublished author is that the published author never quit. And that really resonated with me uh, because of, of buds and you know ringing the bell and, and all that sort of thing. So um, never going to ring the bell. That resonated. And uh, so I started writing True Believer the summer of 2016 uh, when I went to Africa uh, to Mozambique and started doing the research uh, for where the, the novel really uh, kicks off. So I was always going to write two, which, which allowed me to, to, to get that one out within the year of the first novel. This, uh, this third one, of course, will, uh, will get, us, get us to three in three years. True Believer is out July 30th by Jack Carr. I've read the book, and it's wonderful. The pace and the tempo is phenomenal, and it's a tremendous sequel to Jack's first book, The Terminal List. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely, absolutely. I feel like we should keep talking. <laughs> I know. Uh, did you get your uh, Toyota Land Cruiser back? Oh, it's going to be a while. I think it's a six to eight month restoration. So it's uh, pulled the engine out last week, doing whatever they have to do before they drop in the uh, the new one. So oh, it's, I, uh, I can't <laughs> wait to see it. What year is it? It's an 88, 88, 88. FJ62. They're awesome. Yep, exactly. And I think, uh, you know, having those in the novel, so in the second, well, in the third novel that I'm working on now, I really use the the Land Rover, Land Cruiser debate to as a character development tool. Oh, that's characters. cool. So, <laughs> so, yeah, I use that along with the, uh, you know, 9mm versus 45 uh, debate, Striker Fire versus, you know, uh, the 1911 platform, Kydex versus Leather. So I have two characters that I uh, juxtapose using those tools. Oh, that's pretty neat. We wanted to ask you about the SIGs because I knew you were a SIG guy and Brad was a Glock guy, so uh, we'll be able to get some good social media tweets out of that. Perfect. So I, I actually have plenty of both. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a Glock and a SIG within reach right now. So, uh, so yeah, people will not go wrong with either a Glock or a SIG, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> All that's right. It. Well, thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for this conversation with Stratfor's Chief Security Officer, Fred Burton, and Jack Carr, author of True Believer, the second in the James Reese series. 
We'll include details about True Believer and Jack Carr in the show notes, as well as a link to Fred Burton's latest novel, Beirut Rules. If you're interested in learning how Stratfor can help provide you with the analytic products and tools to visualize and anticipate those areas in the world where your interests and operations are at the greatest risk, be sure to visit stratfor.com slash enterprise. And we'd love to hear your suggestions about who Fred Burton should interview next. Please send us your ideas to podcast at stratfor.com. Also, feel free to leave a review on the podcast page on iTunes or wherever you listen. We really do appreciate your feedback. And for more geopolitical intelligence, as well as links to our content, follow us on Twitter at Stratfor. I'm Ben Sheen. Thanks for listening.